Great. Thanks a lot, Sean, and, and welcome, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us for the third and final workshop in this series. And as we mentioned, Chris will be joining us a little bit later today. So the final promised stage of this algebra workshop that we've been looking at is thinking about equations and particularly focusing in on linear equations and moving on from what we talked about previously, which was thinking about the structure of an expression and thinking about how those expressions can vary when the value of the variable within it varies. And then moving on now and thinking, well, what's going to happen when we pin that down to a particular value for the expression? So therefore, we want to be able to find an unknown value, but not just when we pin that down to a number in a very simple linear equation. But what about when we put two expressions, one equal to the other and think about what value of n we might have or x we might have in that situation? So um, I know. Sean did send out this problem for people to have a look at before the session, but I appreciate you might not have had the opportunity to do that. But it says, please find the perimeter of the rectangle. And uh, Chris's students in his year 11 always knew whether I'd written the question or Chris, because I always put please and he doesn't. So find the perimeter of the rectangle. So we can see we've got the expressions 15, 3n plus 12 and 5n plus 2. And also that this has been stated within the question that it is a rectangle, otherwise we would have to think about the structure of this as a quadrilateral rather than a rectangle. So having to think about that, finding the perimeter, I imagine people have tried some different approaches to this and have come out with an answer. And I imagine you've probably checked that answer just in case I put you on the spot. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but hopefully you've had a chance to think about it beforehand. Um, so thinking about this, what I'd like us to think about now is this question. So what might the end result of teaching linear expressions look like? So if we've taught linear expressions and then we're starting to teach um, think about linear equations today, what, do we, what would we want the end result to be? What would we want the outcomes to be for the young people in your classrooms? So if you just have a think about that, and I will put up some things hopefully hopefully going to prompt some of the thoughts about this and um, so if we have a look at what we've got here i've suggested that pupils would understand the properties of a rectangle pupils would know that the sides are represented by expressions albeit one of the expressions is a number but it's still an expression pupils understand that expressions with n in vary because n can vary and pupils understand that for this quadrilateral to be a rectangle, the opposite sides should be equal length. And then the final prompt I've got is pupils know how to solve the problem by equating the expressions for the opposite sides. So quite a lot of studies for, for several decades actually have identified that what teachers often do is leap to the last of those prompts, leap to the final one, and think about how do students actually solve the equation that is generated when they've equated 5n plus 2 to 3n add 12. How do they do that? So there's a lot of focus and a lot of attention given to manipulation and a lot of focus on the processes that students might need to go through to actually solve the problem. Whereas very often many of the errors or many of the difficulties that students face is actually decoding the problem in the first place and being able to get inside that problem and realize that that's what they need to do in the first place. So taking time to actually interrogate the structure and think about the question allows people to think about what they need to do to be able to solve this. So just given a kind of a free reign without being told that this is a solving equations problem, then perhaps the students might just try some guess and check and they try out different values of n. And that in itself, I think, is really good because that demonstrates that the students realize what n represents, that n represents a number. But if we'd have a look at what a very fluent response might look like, a very fluent response might be that the students are able to equate these using that lovely algebraic discipline of creating an equation. They might then be able to have some skills whereby they can manipulate that equation and start to rearrange it. Sorry, not rearrange it, try to start to solve it. And then they can understand that when you solve that equation, n equals five. And unfortunately, for some students, that's where it stops. They don't actually go through the process of encoding the problem at the end, encoding the solution at the end in the context of the problem. So that they're able to say that when n equals five, the perimeter equals whatever it is that the perimeter equals in this particular case. So we start, we're able to have a look at this and we're able to think about the problem. We're able to think about the solution of the problem. So what we're also able to do then is ask ourselves, 
how can we get to that point where the majority of the students in our classrooms can actually produce some sort of fluent solution like this, but also that they can go back to the original problem and start to think about what is this asking of me? What do I need to be able to do? Now, racing to this fluency and racing to this process of manipulation and this process of answering the question can sometimes mean that students think that algebra is about mindless manipulation and not necessarily about representing relationships and getting inside of structures of problems that can actually be represented using algebra, using general terms in algebra. That's before we even start to get onto other applications of algebra, such as in sequences, series, um, trigonometry, um, linear graphs, and so on. So in this particular context, they might race to manipulation without actually pausing and actually thinking about what does this mean and what is it that I need to do to be able to get to this point. So all of those things are important, understanding what the problem is about, understanding that they need to equate two expressions is important, being able to manipulate the problem is important, and then being able to come up with the answer at the end is also important. So if we go back to this problem and think about, okay, what, which ways have we talked about to help students make sense of some of the um, representations that we've talked about already? So make sense of these, this problem, perhaps by using something like this where we use a bar or, or an algebra tile to think about 5n could be represented by five equivalent lengths. And then we can have a block at the end to represent the two or two individual counters if we wanted to. And then we could do the same for the opposite side and we could start to represent that with three multiplied by a length that we're gonna call n and then add 12. And because of the structure of this problem, we know that those two lengths have to be equivalent. We know that we're equating them and those two sides have to be equivalent. So that gives an opportunity to look at this and start to ask students what is different and what is the same about the two equivalent lengths, the way that they've been represented. And that perhaps then provides students with a way in of just looking at this and thinking, oh, n must be five. Of course it must be five. Because when we look at what is different, the two n add two at the top and the 12 at the bottom, have to be equivalent. So this enables students to start to imagine why the solution might be five. We could also start to think about, sorry, there we go. What's going on here? Okay, so we can also start to think about questions that help students to get inside this before they're racing to the solution of five. So by getting inside it, I mean, interrogate it and just take it apart a little bit. Think about what it means. Think about what it represents. So this question might actually stimulate that getting inside the problem. So have a think about that question and then have a think about the sorts of responses you might hope for from your pupils when you've asked them that question. How do we know that N is not 10? Would anybody like to unmute and suggest some responses you might hope for? How do we know it can't be 10? Yeah, uh, two sides of the rectangle will be different. Thanks very much, Sam. Yeah, absolutely spot on. So if n was 10, we'd have 52 and 42. So it's no longer a rectangle. It's a quadrilateral, but it's no longer a rectangle. So that is helping us realize that we're looking for a value of n, possibly, because if students make sense of that question. Similarly with this question, would this be a rectangle if n equals 20? And again, we could get inside that and think about, would it be a rectangle? Well, the two opposite sides definitely wouldn't be the same length if n was equal to 20, but then we can start to ask ourselves, would it even be a quadrilateral if n was equal to 20? So if n did equal 20, we would have 102 for the length represented by 5n plus two, and we'd have 72 for the length represented by 3n plus 12. So could we actually join the sides? Well, we could, but as long as this length that's not labeled with an expression is actually not 15, then we could make a quadrilateral. But by putting a star next to that, I think I'm able to acknowledge that this would be a challenge. That would be a challenge question. And this is one of the models that we use when we're talking about um, uh, uh, the sorts of classrooms where we might differentiate, where we might want to have things that students can do, but then also think about challenges for those who find those things those things trivial. So in those particular contexts, what we're able to do is think, well, that star question could be a challenge. We could actually have quite a lot of mathematical inquiry and a, a, quite a lot of 
thought going into that question, would this be a quadrilateral if n equals 20? And under what conditions would it be a quadrilateral? So then we're getting, once again, I keep using this word structure, but we're getting inside the structure of what this image represents and hopefully providing some ways of interrogating it so that when we actually do start to think about under what conditions is it a rectangle and what value of n we would need to make it a rectangle, then students have got some insight of when it is and when it is not a rectangle. So thinking about some of the things I mentioned last time in terms of actually equipping students with the ability to be able to understand what a variable is and understand what it means to solve an equation. We talked about the sweets in a cup as a model of a discrete countable object that varies. So modeling a ver uh, the variable as how many sweets are there in a cup. And we also suggested that having an opaque container would be a really good idea. So the students know that there is something inside the container, but they don't know how many. So by starting to introduce them to this process of algebra, they can, as we talked about last time, they can think about expressions, but then they can start to think about, well, what happens if I make two expressions equivalent? So on the one side here, we can see that we've got 5n add 2, and then the other side, we're making this equal to the expression 3n add 12. And we could just stop, we could just start to think about what that represents and what we might know already about the number of suites in the cup. So students often come up with some informal ways of explaining how many suites are in a cup when they see this image and then they start to manipulate this image, especially if it's been constructed within the classroom using counters and using cups inside the classroom. But then we do want students to actually learn that algebraic discipline that we saw in the end result a moment ago. We do want them to be able to learn that we want to keep the, these statements um, to have that kind of lovely algebraic rigor where each statement is true, but it's kind of telling the story of how we might solve an equation. So going from that first line to that second line, we can see that the number of suites on each side of the image are still the same, even though we've been able to remove three cups from each side. Then we can do exactly the same when we start to think about removing suites from each side. The number of suites on each side of the image is still equivalent but now we're able to simplify it to the point where 2n would equal 10. So we're taking two expressions and we're equating them. So the solution of n equals 5 falls out of that. But often when the students see this, and they see this as two equivalent expressions actually built physically in the classroom, they're shouting out the answer. They're shouting out that n equals 5 quite early on. So they're equating expressions. They're solving an equation by equating those expressions. But normally they don't see it in that particular way until quite far into their study of equations. If you look at many typical textbooks, they'd start with simple equations and often call them things like one stage or two stage equations, where they're kind of stimulating this idea that linear equations are always about an input and an output. Now that idea is fabulous and that idea is really, really important when we're doing some aspects of maths, particularly functions. But when we're looking at the discipline of solving equations, it might not, not necessarily be what we want to draw the student's attention to. So if we have a think about how we might help students to get inside this, this is one of those equations where we do have an expression equal to an expression, but everything they need to do to be able to solve that is kind of just not really, not necessarily algebraic thinking. They can just use their knowledge of numeracy to be able to solve that because they'd be thinking three times something plus seven equals 22. If I think about it for a few minutes, I might be able to realize exactly what it is that would make that true. So they're not necessarily using this idea of um, equating two expressions when they have this expression equal to a number, albeit 22 is an expression, but they're not necessarily using the algebraic thinking that we were talking about a second ago. Similarly with this one, even though we might say that this is uh, in textbooks might be come a little bit later than the last one because of the brackets, it might be deemed to be harder. But if we're choosing a, a model whereby we're saying, okay, let's unpick what this expression represents and think of this physical and visual way we can represent it, one expression is going to equal to another, another expression so that this one is not necessarily harder than the one that we did in the first place. Now, I hope that you're noticing that this is limited and this is limited to everything just being um, positive terms at the moment and all of the values of n all being positive integers. So of course it's limited because that's what scaffolding is. That's about limiting the student's choices. And if those limits that we put on are actually part of a really cohesive and carefully planned progression, then we're okay. 
But if we never get beyond those limited models, then a lot of students are not going to be okay. So if this is a carefully chosen starting point that is part of a bigger program or a bigger plan that actually enables people to make sense of expressions when they do have negative terms or they do have negative solutions, then maybe it's okay. Maybe it's okay to start with this very limited a scaffolded model. Um, similar one here, similar to the one that we started with. So the idea of equating expression to expression means that this one, where we do have the term you often hear, which is unknown on, unknowns on both sides, then we have something that actually structurally can be solved in the same way and can be reasoned in the same way as the one where one of the expressions was just a number, like the 3 and 7 equals 19. So the other thing we need to think about is uh, for many students, they will have developed maths anxiety in relation to algebra. There'll be a significant minority of students in your school who do, have convinced themselves that they don't do algebra. And this is, these are the students that I spend quite a long time working with. One of the ways that we can help them to demystify that is actually starting with the solution and building the equation up. So if we start with the idea that the number of sweets in the cup is three, and then give students some freedom to think about what they could do to both of these expressions to maintain the equivalence, then they might start to communicate some algebraic thinking and start to build some equations that actually takes away some of the anxiety associated with not necessarily knowing what's expected of them in algebra. So we can, for example, we can multiply by four, we could add five to both expressions, and we could add another cup to both sides. So we could add N. And then we've got something that might initially appear like a scary equation for N add five equals N add 17. But because the students have built that up themselves and then they've got the capacity to think about, okay, how do we get back to the beginning? And then we can start to see a lovely flow of the different operations that have applied, been applied to both equations at the same time and think about how they might undo those, how they might use inverse operations to actually undo that and end up with the n equals three. Okay, similarly, um, as we talked about last time, the, the limitation of the model we just shared is that every term is positive, but also it's only representing a discrete countable number of objects. So if we want students to have a deeper understanding of the a wider domain for their algebraic thinking, then they need to really think about perhaps a model whereby the n is modeled as a length so that we can have any rational number to represent the length like we can see in this one. So if n plus three represents the length of the, uh, of the side of this regular polygon, we can start to think about what happens when we do start with an integer length, but then we can bring in non-integer lengths. Now, as you know perfectly well, you don't want the, num the numeracy, the demands on numeracy to be so great that the students miss the point completely of what it is that you want them to learn. So you don't want the demands on numeracy to be so great in this particular context so that they don't actually learn anything about the algebra. They're just worried about the numeracy. So starting with numeracy that doesn't put on too much cognitive de demand to the students is great, as long as the plan is to actually allow them to see that it applies to all sorts of different values. And they even then think about those ones on the periphery, like what happens when n equals zero? What happens when n equals 0 0.1 and so on? And so questions you can ask here that are designed to stimulate some sort of reasoning. It's not about chasing answers. It's actually about being given the answer and then thinking about how you would know that that is the answer. So using reasoned, um, reasoning from what they know to actually make sense of the value of the perimeter being 65 or the perimeter being 50 and so on. Similarly, when we then apply that to problems where um, you might recognize similar sorts of structures to, to some GCSE problems or some other questions that you've asked students. If students are faced with expressions like this, at the moment where each of these expressions are positive, then we can bring in that idea of this length being represented by a stick and we can help students make sense of what the perimeter might be in those particular contexts. And then they can be faced with a problem where they might draw on those images themselves to enable them to have some access to questions like this. But that would be quite limited because not every question where they need to connect geometry and algebra is gonna be presented in this particular way. But it's a very, what I call realizable context because the students can actually see that the length is being applied to a perimeter and can actually make these shapes. They can draw these shapes. They can get their ruler out and use centimeters to draw these to, to scale and start to make sense of some of the answers that they're, 
uh, they're expecting to to find. Um, and then similarly, you know, to other problems like this, we could apply solving equations to problems like this, where we could draw the sticks on, but then we can actually get students to probe and think about which values of n does this not exist for as a triangle and so on. So we can start to, or well, perhaps actually that one would be better for that, but we can, we can use these contexts of perimeters as, as a really nice way, I think, for expecting students to make sense of the idea of n modeling a variable length. And we can use that and we can annotate the pictures to hopefully make some of these problems a little bit more accessible. So I'll just stop there and pause for any questions just before we go back and look at some of the applications of the algebra tiles. Any, anything in the chat there, Sean? No, nothing yet. Yeah, if anybody wants to ask a question and you don't want to unmute, you're welcome to put anything in the chat. Um, there's nothing there yet. Okay, brilliant. Thanks. And um, Sean, do, do, did you recognise any of those kind of issues with learning algebra that I was mentioning earlier from, from your work in schools? Yeah, definitely. I think um, it's that you, it's, it's that um, connecting with the visual images with the with the the bars and the tiles and stuff. I think um, you don't. I don't see that a lot. Yeah, and I think sure. that's the way, I mean, when you start using that, it makes it clearer. And I think that engages better with, yeah. with some learners. Yeah, thank you. And I think about 10, 15 years ago, it was identified that particularly in key stage three, when we're compared to other countries in the United Kingdom, we're not doing so great in terms of algebraic reasoning. There's been various um, movements to try and help us improve that. But quite a few studies do converge on the same idea that we're actually spending too much time on algebraic manipulation and not enough time on the meaning and interrogating the meaning of, um, of what algebra is all about. So I think by choosing concepts carefully and thinking about, you know, take that first question that we sent out beforehand, the one with the rectangle, thinking about how you could get a lot of depth out of one question rather than a lot of repeated practice of many questions that don't necessarily illuminate the structure, then I think there's um, there's a lot to be said for that. But as we said before, you know, it, sometimes that means changing the context for learning, and that can mean you have to negotiate those things really carefully with the young people in the classroom. Okay, cool. so we'll plow on. So having a look at uh, what we've got here, we can see here that we've got two equivalent expressions. So even though the, um, the bars have been rearranged through the algebra tiles here, the three n plus six, draws attention to this idea that we've got three times this length of n at six, or we've got three groups of n at two in the one at the bottom. And this looks quite nice, it looks, it looks good, but there are some problems inherent to this. And the problem we mentioned last time is that there is actually a fixed length to that algebra tile there. So by giving students the opportunity to actually build these and think about what these look, might look like or to draw them on a number line, I think is quite a powerful way of getting them to realize that this is a representation of something that's actually varying. Even though it's fixed, it's representing something that's actually varying. So we have exactly the same problem then when we start to think about these linear expressions rather than linear equations. These are linear expressions rather than linear equations. But when we start to think about how we might solve equations, then we've got a similar problem. So these are two images that I've taken from that paper that you can see for reference there at the bottom. So we've got two different approaches, one which kind of perhaps is a picture of algebra tiles, the Fong and Chong one at the top, and then the one from Dickinson and Ede where you can see the jumps along the number line. And I can talk to you a little bit more about where they come from if you're interested. But you can see that those two images don't necessarily have the problem of the blue tile being fixed because they've been drawn. But nonetheless, they've still been represented as something that does actually have a length. So this is a, a huge difficulty for young people and we need to spend time with them experiencing what it means for something to vary and actually getting them to think about what would these lines look like if n was seven? What would these bars look like if n was two? And actually get them to think about what, what these images are representing by actually trying out some accessible, specific, particular examples um, by using particular numbers, choosing particular numbers in those contexts. And then you've probably seen some of these kind of balance scale approaches as well at some points, which um, you can see this one at the bottom here is trying to model a negative term, which is problematic. 
both of the ones at the top are not trying to model a negative term, but once as soon as we bring negative terms in, we do face problems. So we need to have a, a plan. We need to have a cohesive plan that whereby whatever experiences we're giving students in the early days of their algebraic reasoning needs to link with what we want it to terminate with, what, or not terminate with, converge on. What do we want it to move on to? So it's really, care, really important that we select quite carefully how we do that. This image here now is trying to use those algebra tasks to actual, actually model the solution to an equation. Now, this one is great because what's going to happen here is we can see that we can take the two away that are both the same in the, in the top row and the bottom row. Then we can start to take the three x's away that are both the same in the top row and the bottom row. And we can have this lovely solution that x equals seven. And it, that's great because the seven ones do actually fit just about in the length of this bar. But well, that's going to be problematic when it's not seven because the students are going to want those things to match up. So moving it onto those images that we saw a second ago can, op can often be something that is an advantage because we can draw those as bars that are a slice of the number line, whereby the X can be drawn as an image that can be um, chosen carefully so that it, it, it's realizable so that students can understand the solution. Because if we're using algebra tiles in this way, the particular set that I've got here anything beyond seven or six is not going to be believable. So it's complex when we're choosing these different representations, but it is possible to choose it in a way that is very realizable in a way that is um, cohesive in terms of what we want students to do next, what we want the next steps of learning to be. This is quite a nice idea because what we could do here is use this wonderful resource from MathSpot to actually represent this equation where one expression is represented by 4x add 2 on the left hand side, and that is equivalent to, I can't remember how many ones I put there now, 3x add 9, is it 9? Yeah, 3x add 9 on the right hand side. So we don't have that problem of trying to make the bars align. But then we've also perhaps got a problem because are we really modeling the value of the expression or are we just giving students tiles in a way to manipulate in the same way as we might have done symbols so how can we give them some sense of meaning from what's going on here but the huge advantage of this is it enables us to think about negative terms and i don't know if anybody started to use this this um idea of zeros or zero pairs where x plus negative x is actually equivalent to zero so we use that idea as a way of solving equations. And that's, that's one approach that I'm not going to talk about today, but I'd love to talk to people about in the future if it's something they're interested in. So the advantage of using these kind of blobs of tiles either side of a, one image on one side and one image on the other, the advantage of those is very much like the advantage of the sweets in the cup. It doesn't rely on it being a slice of a line, but that's also a limitation. And it's a limitation because we're not allowing students to realize that the value of those expressions can vary and giving them any sense of a sense or framework for making sense of how those values vary. So I don't think I've found, unfortunately, I don't think I've found one perfect representation, but I have found that by be given, being given different representations and being given ways to interrogate that and make sense of it, students are actually starting to demystify some of their thoughts about and starting to build a more reasoned insight into algebra so thinking about the number line so i'm just actually just going to stop a second for for some questions and then we're going to have a look at some of the math spot resources in a little bit more detail there to think about the number line okay anybody got any questions um Anybody tried using algebra tiles or using sweets in a cup or something similar, you know, like lollipop sticks in an envelope, that sort of thing? Has anybody tried those representations in the classroom? Okay, okay. so what, what we did say we'd, we'd pause for some questions at the end and have some discussion at the end. So we, so we, we will do that. Um, so what I'm going to do is we're going to look at two equations now, and both of the models that I'm going to show you are exactly the same equation as the one we met with the rectangle at the start. So I think that is 5n add 2 equals 3n add 
12. I'm pretty sure that's the one we have, hoping so. So we're going to have a look at some of the representations in math, in MathSpot. Now, MathSpot, um, like any application, you know, you might spend a little bit of time practicing it and getting used to it before you use it live in the classroom. But what I always recommend to the beginning teachers that I work with is that they have some some versions of it open already with the images that they want to present when they're using it in the first time because they don't want to get caught struggling to manipulate something or clicking the wrong arrow and then suddenly things don't go well but as you gain more confidence with it you will be able to use it more interactively in the classroom is anybody using MathSpot? not necessarily for algebra tasks but is anybody using any of the applications on MathSpot already okay perhaps when i click on it it might seem a little bit more familiar um, people will be able to see. I, uh, I, I do use it for the problems solved, you know, the problem solving questions and whatnot. And there's good starters on there. So okay. I do use it most weeks. Yeah, that's great. So you're familiar with it. It's a wealthy resource, isn't it? With lots of different things we can do with it. That's great. Thank you. Um, so what I've, I've set up here two bars now that are the same length and they're trying to represent that equation where we've got the idea that we've got 5n add 2 is equivalent to 3n add 12. So these bars could take on all sorts of different values, n could vary, could take on all sorts of different values, but what we're actually looking for is pinning it down to the one unknown value that would enable those two bars to have the same length. So they're no longer behaving like expressions where we can take any value at all, we're pinning it down to the one specific value that we want, that will make them the same length. And because these are linear relationships, we know that we're, we're looking for one value. We're looking for one relationship, one, one number to come out of this relationship. So when we look at this, we can ask students to tell us what they see. They could, we'd ask them to say, what is different about the bar on the top and the bar on the bottom? What is the same about the bar on the top and the bar on the bottom? And then ask them to think about what it represents so that they're given some chance to get used to the model and interrogate the model before we introduce the idea of kind of um, the end result of modeling a, a lovely, um, elegant and fluent equation solving process so we can get them to get inside it before we do anything else and again you can ask those questions like if these two bars are the same how do you know that n equals 10 that n in n that n doesn't equal 10 and so on so thinking about this hopefully they start to see that we've actually got these two parts here the 3n and the 3n are exactly the same so that we can think about that and we can that's going to pick all of it up actually oops that's not what i wanted Okay, I'm not going to do that. What, what I would then do is think about how we can compare these n equals these two n plus two to the twelve. So we can cover this bit up along the side here. Actually, that's what I'll do. I'm going to try and remove it because there we go. So we'll cover that up. There we went. So this is exactly the point I was trying to make about not uh, not trying to manipulate it. This is a there we go. I do apologize to the designer of this for not doing this as well as I should. There we go. Okay, so if we cover this bit up, then that should work. There we go. That's what I was looking for. So we cover this up now so that we get 2n add 2 being equivalent to 12. So we're now well on the way to be able to solve this because we've got this much simpler relationship than the one we had before. Because if 2n add 2 is equal to 12, we can start to realize that those 2n must be equal to 10. So the, the solution is demystified. We're able to see the solution from what we've done there. So then the other application we've got here is actually uh, what I'm trying to do is model something a little bit like the, um, the one from uh, Ede and Dickinson, where they're using a, a a bar, sorry, a line to represent the number line. So what we've got here is I can't make that bar any thinner in terms of its height. But if I was doing it in, um, with pen and paper on a whiteboard, which we will be doing in a moment, then we can start to think about um, just modeling it as a slice of the number line. So we want to get to the same point on the number line and we want to start to think about how we can do that. So exactly the same idea here, exactly the same idea as we saw a moment ago, where we're able to see that 5n add 2 is equivalent to 3n add 12. So that's nice. That's a nice thing to do. We can compare it in a very, very similar way 
as we could a moment ago with the bar. But what I'm going to do now is actually change the equation. It's no longer going to be the equation that we had at the start from the rectangle. It's going to be similar, but what I'm going to do is look at the consequences of changing the add to to subtract to. So 5n subtract 2 is going to be equal to 3n add 12. So what I want you to do is just spend a minute and think about how might we represent that? How might we adapt this image that you can see on the screen now to actually represent an equation where it's 5n subtract 2 rather than 5n add 2? But keep the 3n add 12 the same. So I'll just give you a minute to think about that and think about what it is you might want to do. Okay, so thinking about what's changed here. So what's changed is the 5n is now, the 5n at subtract two means that the bar that we're talking about is actually going to be shorter than the 5n itself, than the 5n add two. So what I might want to do is actually think about, well, okay, I could make that bar smaller. So I could take the length and I could reduce the length because what we want to do now is actually represent it as 5n subtract two. So what we've got here is that this 12 is now in the wrong place because the length of this bar is 3n add 12. So my 12 is no longer representative of what it is that I'm trying to demonstrate here. So I'd actually need to bring the 12 down to this point here so we can see what the 12 is representing. But if I wanted to think about, well, actually, what is 5n equivalent to? So we've got our 3n add 12 is equivalent to 5n, but then with this 2 here, subtracted. So if I were able to rotate that, and we can start to think about, well, actually, then the gap must be 2. So there must be a gap here of 2. So what we're able to do then is think about, OK, well, what do we have here with this bar? We can put this bar back now, and we can think to ourselves, well, that, what we have now is that 5n is equivalent to 3n add 14, which is probably what we wanted the second line of an equation to be if some students were solving this in a kind of more traditional uh, way using, formula, using um, balancing equations using symbols. So we're able to think about what this bar represents. Now that's complex. And if you haven't seen it before, you probably realize that actually I did it in a slightly more clumsy way than it needed to be. But when we're doing these sorts of things, we need to practice and we need to think about how we're going to plan to use a bar to actually tell the story of the equations that we want to represent. And this is something that we hear a lot about where teachers are designing lessons very, very carefully, particularly in countries like Japan. They're planning really carefully the examples that they're going to use, but also planning really carefully how they're going to model them and demonstrate them and present them to students so that the board work becomes a work of art almost, where every stage is carefully planned and carefully structured so that the students are able to make sense of the problems that it is that they're representing. But what we've got here is a paper which is, ex explains what I was just trying to do there far more eloquently than I just did, where they've used this idea with solving equations, they've used this idea with some students in the classroom to try and model the number line as a way of making sense of solving equations. Now, the people who wrote this project have been very involved with the Realizable Realistic Maths Education Program project. In, in MMU, they were involved in that for, for several decades. And they've used some of the ideas which actually came out of the Netherlands, this idea of an empty number line. So the students in the Netherlands, if they are using these models, these number line models to solve equations, if they're using them, um, the idea of the number line from the beginning for, for mental maths processes and for counting processes and so on, then the idea of having the notion of equivalence represented as a slice of a bar is not going to be too alien to them. But I worry a little bit about students in the United Kingdom who haven't grown up with that number line 
in quite the same way. Now, I think that might be changing. I think it might be getting better because I think students in primary schools, children in primary schools are using the number line more than they were. And they're also using bar models more than they were. But we can't just perhaps say to ourselves, okay, we're gonna use this model of the number line if it's not something that's been used consistently beforehand. We'd have to think really carefully about getting students used to the idea of using the number line to represent equivalences before we were able to present this as a, a representation of algebra. So that might mean stripping that back a little bit, but it's an incredibly powerful model. It's an incredibly powerful model that can be used for all sorts of different things, but we wouldn't be able to just jump in with it. We'd have to think really carefully about how we structure it and, and how we make sense of it. So if people are interested in that paper, I will send it to you. But what we know is that when we're starting to solve, starting to represent equations with negative terms, it's not as simple as it is when all of the terms are positive. Now that transition is too much for us to talk about in a, in a one hour workshop. But hopefully what we have done in this session so far is just think about some other representations that we can use to help students make sense of symbolic representations. So just share the PowerPoint that I had earlier, just one more time. And we'll go back to that end result that we had. Sorry, just not sharing particularly comprehensively at the moment. There we go. Okay, so if we go back to this end result, the end result, of this problem, that lovely fluent solution to this problem. This is what we're looking for. This is exactly what we want. We want all students to be able to have that level of fluency and that level of comprehension when they're solving a linear equation. That's what we want. But we may have other ways then of helping them make sense of that and help them connect with that. So language models are really important that they can understand that what they're talking about. They're talking about making an expression on the left-hand side equivalent to the right-hand side. And they understand that when they're solving an equation, they're trying to find, in this particular case, the one unknown value, which would enable the expression on the right-hand side to have the same value as the expression on the left-hand side. They're finding the one unknown value that makes those two expressions have the same value. But they'll have the same value on the first line, second line, and the third line. All of those equations will be representing equivalents when n equals five. So they understand what this is all about, but then they can do it fluently and they can apply it fluently to problems like the rectangle problem. And then they can go back and encode their problem to check that what it is that they've done is actually answering the problem, is actually solving the problem. So we don't want those other things that follow to be the things that replace this. We don't want the algebra tiles to replace this. What we want to do is use algebra tiles, sweets in a cup, the number line, the bar model, whatever it is, whichever of those four it is, to actually support the students' understanding. So what I would suggest is that they start with something discrete and countable, like lollipop sticks in an envelope, or sweets in a cup, or counters in a cup, or whatever it might be. They start with something where they learn that expressions are um, about having a variable value or a value that we don't know, and then thinking about how they can make sense of that by representing it symbolically. But ultimately they need to think, well, we're not only ever going to be talking about positive, discrete, countable objects. So they need to move on at some point to being able to understand that actually a variable length is a powerful model that we can use to help students make sense of this. And as I've suggested, the perimeters are great for that because you can actually think about the relationship between the expressions and the polygons that you're drawing and the, and the perimeters that you're finding for those polygons. So I'll stop there because that is a lot to take in. And it's kind of, um, those of you who weren't at the first two sessions, perhaps the, the second session would help some, fill some of the gaps here if you, didn't, if you didn't hear the second session. So you might want to go back and, and catch up on that. But basically what we've looked at is four different models for solving equations, the something in a cup or something in an envelope, that discrete countable one, the algebra tiles and the algebra tiles used in a couple of different ways. One is a kind of perhaps way of representing it on the bar model. Another way, like the sweets in the cup, just thinking of two different expressions, two pictures either side of some sort of dividing line. And then we've also then looked at how we might use the number line as a representation of um, solving equations and suggested that perhaps moving into the number line helps us model negative terms. But 
sweets in a cup could be modeled using a subtractor as well. All it would mean is that I've got five cups here and I've taken two sweets out of the cups so that we can model five and subtract two there. But what we can't model is a negative solution and can't easily model the idea of having a negative term that involves n. So it's limited and it's restricted, but I'd still suggest that it's valuable as long as it's part of a cohesive plan, we know where it's going. We're aware that we haven't dealt with negative terms, but my argument would be that the students learn deeply and well using positive realizable terms so that then we can start to think about how we then bring in those um, other aspects building on this notion that they do understand what expressions are and they do understand what equations are. They do understand what variables are. They do understand what it means to find an unknown value or to evaluate an expression. Okay, so I think, Sean, we said we were gonna stop recording and then give people some chance